Uh, welcome to Banning House National Historic Site of Canada, the birthplace of insulin. My name is Grant Maltman, and I'm the curator here at this tribute to a national hero and a wonderful uh, discovery. It was here in this house on October 31st, 1920, after a night of restless sleep, Dr. Banting put to paper 25 words that would lead to the discovery of insulin. When he lived in this house, he actually only occupied three rooms, a bedroom here on the second floor and two rooms here on the main floor. He does own the house, but he's basically a boarder in his own house. It's a pretty struggling practice when he was here. Uh, he doesn't take over a retired doctor's practice. His location isn't great. It's not a high traffic area. You could advertise by putting your name in the front window. There's a beautiful silver maple out front, so you're not going to see that. Phone book is a good way to go, but it was published in April. He doesn't move here until June. So he opens the door on July 1st, and his first patient arrives 28 days later. And according to his memoir, it's not even a real medical problem. In 1920 in Ontario, we're still under the Prohibition Act. And his first patient is actually an army officer going to reunion with his men. He tells us in his memoir what happened that afternoon. He was an honest soldier and he wanted to give his men a drink. I thought myself rather good at the bar keeping business today, so I wrote in the prescription and felt good about it. So our great Canadian hero starts off his career as a bootlegger selling illegal alcohol prescriptions, which wasn't that uncommon during that period. Things are starting to grow in his practice, but a wonderful opportunity comes in the fall session at Western University, the medical school. They need demonstrators in surgery, physiology, anatomy, and Banting throws his name in the hat. He wants a job because of the pay. It's going to be $2 an hour. If he does three classes in that first week of the fall session, he will equal his entire July income. And this is how he gets involved with the, the research that led to the discovery of insulin. Uh, he's asked to give a lecture towards the end of October of, of 1920 on a subject he admitted to knowing very little about. He never treated a patient with diabetes. He knew nothing of diabetic diets from, in his own words. All he knew about diabetes was the pancreas is involved you're diagnosed later, late teens, early 20s. The only treatment was a starvation diet of about a thousand calories a day, vegetables thrice boiled before they're given to you. And once you're on that diet, your life expectancy is about six months to two years. So you can't do much of a lecture on three or four sentences. So to the medical school he goes on the 30th of October, that night, uh, he reads everything he can, prepares his lecture that night, as his usual practice, he reads himself to sleep and takes to bed from a surgical journal, and there happens to be an article on some diabetes research that he'd done at the Mayo Clinic. Maybe I should read it, maybe incorporate it into my lecture. So he reads the article, turns out the light, two o'clock in the morning. It was one of those nights when I was restless and could not sleep. I was trying to find ways to get away from debt and worry. The lecture and the article began chasing each other in my mind. At 2 a.m., they came together and gave me the idea. I got up, I wrote down, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Those 25 words would lead to the discovery of insulin 10 months later, after only about 12 weeks of experiments. Western's medical school is still under construction, and we just don't have the facilities here to help facilitate uh, the research. So he's encouraged to go to the University of Toronto, where he meets Professor McLeod, then Charles Best, and the experiments begin on 17th of May, 1921. July 30th, we have our famous picture with Banting Best and the dog. While lowered her blood glucose, uh, the dog did die because of the impurities. Within six months, J.B. Collip has joined the team. And on January 23rd, 1922, almost six months to the day, insulin successfully tested in Leonard Thompson. A death sentence for those living with type 1 diabetes had lifted with the discovery and purification of insulin. One of the really fun things that we get to do here at the museum is introduce to Canadians the other side of Dr. Banting's life. Discover insulin, it casts a long shadow, and, and for many people we don't know what he did before or what he did after. And so two years before the Discover Insulin, he's actually a decorated Canadian war hero, tried to enlist in 1914. In fact, his military career actually predates that. In 1912, he's at Victoria College, he's doing the Canadian Officer Training Corps program. When war is declared in 1914, he tries to enlist, uh, but can't pass the eye exam. The third time trying to sneak in, they let him join because they find out he's in medical school. And so he drops out for uh, basically a semester, semester and a half, and he's doing his military training, returns to medical school, graduates in December of 1916. He arrives in England 
in uh, April of 1917, and then it moves over to France in June of 1918 after being promoted to captain. It's a fairly uneventful tour until the Battle of Canal du Nord in Cambrai at the end of September of 1918. Uh, Battle starts at 5.20 a.m. with a glorious barrage and Fanny's helping treat and clear wounded as a member of the 13th Field Ambulance. He's wounded uh, that later that day, a piece of shrapnel catches in the right arm, basically making him useless as a right-handed surgeon. He disobeys orders to evacuate to the rear and according to some of the reports, helps triage for about 17 hours. For his action that day, because quote, his energy and pluck were of a high order, King George awards him the Military Cross, the second highest now for bravery in the empire, one below the more famous Victoria Cross. But 100,000 were eligible for the MC and just under 3,000 received it. So three years before the discovery of insulin, that is actually a decorated Canadian national war hero. This is the most important room in our house and our most important artifact. This is Dr. Banting's bed and it was here the world changed. 102 years ago. It was in this very room on October 31st, 1920, that Banting awoke from his restless sleep and penned his 25 word hypothesis. We get visitors from around the world coming to experience this space from the world's leading scientists to people living with diabetes and the, and the cultural community. Um, Everybody wants to take a picture with the bed. They'll accidentally bump into it because they're good museum patrons and knowing that they're not supposed to touch it. But they'll look at the wallpaper and say, oh, it's the original. And they'll say, yes, but that's not the mattress that's Banting's, it's the frame. And you can see where people have rubbed the finish off. I one time had a scientist come through, a diabetes researcher. I didn't realize he was in the field. He comes in and he sits on the bed, which is fine. And we allow people to do that. And I say, well, it's not the mattress, it's the frame and he'll touch it. The next thing I know, he's laying down. So, you know, he sees this look on my face and he sits up and he says, you'll never know what this means to me. I've been doing diabetes research for more than 30 years in Argentina. This is like the greatest moment in my field. Maybe now that I've been here, maybe now I can finish Banting's work. With 520 million people around the world living with diabetes today, that number doubling every 10 years, you know, we are tempted to let him stay and have a nap and, and see what comes of it. Others find it difficult to come in because it can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, that really speaks to the importance of place was a young mother. She's maybe 10, uh, or she just had a baby and maybe 10 months old, this child was, and was diagnosed with type one. It was the youngest in Southwestern Ontario. And as a mom, this was just overwhelming. And, and as a new parent, you just want to learn everything. And so she, left her husband and the baby at the hospital, comes here, does the tour of the museum, sits on the bed and let's go. And, and that's fine. If you're crying in here, you get it. You, uh, you're not the first person to cry. You're not gonna be the last. And so we gave her a few minutes and came back with some Kleenex. And as I entered the room, she stands up and says, no, thank you. I will never shed another tear on this. My child is going to live because of what happened in this room all those years ago. 101, 102 years later, we have better insulin. What we don't have is anything better than insulin, which makes this place so important to so many people from around the world. And what's been incredible is we left a small display uh, where people could see his memoir and his hypothesis and, and see one of the great ironies, the discoverer of insulin can't even spell his disease. Uh, it's not diabetes from the Latin, it's I'm Fred Banting and I'm not a great speller, but great penmanship. Uh, there's nothing that he's written that, that we can't decipher. And we left these blank note cards for people. Uh, you know, look, you know, I'll be honest, I was thinking it might be made for a sneaky guest book, but instead it's, it's people writing to Dr. Banting who's been gone for more than, than 80 years. Dear Dr. Banting, thank you for giving me an opportunity to lead a fulfilling life with my family. Dear Dr. Banting, this is the greatest moment for all children with type one. My daughter diagnosed last week at age two deserves to live. These are our messages of hope. Researchers talking about how they're re-inspired and reinvigorated into their work. Uh, people on having their diversaries. Uh, dear Dr. Banting, this is my 16th diversary. I just came here to let you know I'm alive and doing well. And what really speaks to the importance of place um, is just the simple fact that when they're writing them, there's this expectation he's going to read them because they're no different than the letters he received in the 20s and in the 30s when he was alive.
2023 marks the 100th anniversary of the awarding of Canada's first Nobel Prize, and that's the 1923 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine awarded not to Banting and Best, but in fact to Banting and John McLeod, the overseer of the project. When Banting is a, finds out he has to share the Nobel with McLeod, quote, Stockholm, go to hell, and he tries to refuse uh, the prize. The refusal lasts for part of a day. He's told he has no choice but to accept. He is the first person associated with the University of Toronto to win a Nobel Prize. He's the first Canadian to win a Nobel Prize. And at age 31, for discovery made at age 29, he's the youngest to win any of the Nobel Prizes. And to this day, he's still the youngest to have won it in physiology or medicine. What Bandy says, though, he accepts the prize is, I'm sending a telegram to Harvard University, where Charles Best is a guest of the great American diabetologist, Elliot Jocelyn. Banting, address, excuse me, uh, Best addresses the, the crowd of the Harvard community and receives a standing ovation. And when the clapping stops, Dr. Jocelyn stands up and says, Charlie, I have to read this telegram aloud. And it was from Dr. Banting himself. Charlie, if Hurt Nobel Committee won't recognize you, to you I ascribe half my prize money, Fred. So Banting, this great man, for the discovery of insulin is now has a status elevated within the public's mind anyways, because it's giving half his prize money away to his graduate student. Professor McLeod, uh, a few days later, would give half of his prize money to uh, Dr. Call, the fourth man of the team, sort of the forgotten man in this story, the man who purifies insulin for human use. It's a little less generous way. Uh, McLeod is quoted saying, I've spoken with Dr. Kolb. He's agreed to give, uh, to take half my money. So you see this distinction between the two and it, the politicking begins, and this is where the banting and best story begins around the discovery of insulin. The Nobel Committee itself is stuck because you can only give a Nobel Prize to three people and you can only give a prize to someone who's been nominated. And so no one nominates Best because he's a graduate student. No one nominates Collip because he's known for purifying insulin. And so you get two for Banting, one for McLeod, and a joint Banting and McLeod. They, in fact, tried to give it to McLeod first when the subcommittee comes through to the, the case is made. And then the discussion hinges around, well, you know, this Banting guy was there from start to finish. It was his idea. Are we sure we have it? And so the committee goes back and again reviews all the literature and what have you and then come back you know in my mind it's the you know we've seen the error of our ways and you should go to go to banting and at which point the committee says yes but you know it was mcleod who had the lab space it was mcleod who showed banting how to operate on a dog it was mcleod who suggested switching from the saline solution to an alcohol solution and it was mcleod who had the clout to bring this call up on board and it was around this period of the discussions that august crow the 1921 Nobel Prize winner and later founder of what is now Novo Nordisk uh, said find a way to give it to them both and, and the, the wording is fantastic as we have here in the display the professorial staff of the Caroline Institute has considered the work of Banting and McLeod to be of such importance theoretically so that covers McLeod's 40 years of carbohydrate metabolism and this body of work that, and expertise he's built and practically Banting being the guy to help bring it from the beaker to the bedside, that it is resolved toward them the great distinction of the Nobel Prize. They don't go to the Nobel ceremony together. In fact, they don't go until 1925, and they have to have two ceremonies because the two of them uh, would, uh, at all opportunities, refuse to be in the same room together. One of the least known aspects of Dr. Banting's life and career was also perhaps the most important aspect of his later life was his love of art. It was a hobby he started here in London. One patient in 28 days gives him a lot of free time. Like everybody else in London, bad start, watercolor brushes, oil paints, tries drawing pictures from magazines, and he's so poor he's actually painting on the cardboard uh, when his clothes came back from the laundromat. In the mid-20s, he begins exhibiting show, his work at shows at the University of Toronto, where critics said the only art school Banting represented was the medical school. Maybe she should stick to what he knows. But it was during this period, he met Lauren Harris, who later introduced him to his new best friend, A.Y. Jackson, of Canada's Group of Seven. They painted the North, uh, the townships of Quebec, 
the Eastern Arctic, the Western Arctic, and for Banting, it became his great escape and became quite prolific, about 200 works. Uh, tough way to learn to paint. They'd often paint the same scene. One would be Banting, one would be Jackson's, and Banting would write in his memoir, the laws of average say, I'll make a good painting, so I'll paint until I do. At 50, I'm done with science. Science is a young man's game. I can't wait until this war is over so Alex and I can go back to the country and paint again. And I warrant she was killed at age 49. Few people knew about Dr. Bandy's life in the First World War, even fewer know his involvement in the Second World War, which actually began before in 1938-39 when he joined the National Research Council and became chairman of the Associate Committee on Aviation Medicine and Medical Research. Some of the projects he was involved with was the Franks Flying Suit, the first G-suit for fighter pilots to prevent pilot blackouts from those G-forces. Made of rubber, filled with water, on tight like a girdle, this helps the heart pump the blood into the brain. Uh, because it's not a safe way to test using a biplane, uh, pulling steep dives, uh, Banty convinced the government of Canada to give him $29,000 and he built our first man-rated centrifuge at a secret base at the north end of Toronto. Some of the other work, a little more controversial, uh, self-inflicted mustard gas wound. Said if you're gonna be a military scientist, you must be willing to take some of the risk yourself. Uh, the experiments started to, to go sideways on him and they rushed him to the hospital where they prepared to amputate his leg and he allegedly says, no, this is my experiment, rewrap it, I'm going home. I need to be in London, Ontario in three days to speak to a town and gown council. Out of that meeting came the Allies' second decompression chamber to simulate high altitude flights. He was killed on February 21st, 1920 while flying over to England on a secret mission, probably taking the Frank's flying suit over at a minimum, what he's doing is help coordinate transfer of technology from England to the senior realm here in Canada. The plane takes off from Gander, Newfoundland, developed engine failure. It's a twin engine plane. They turn around to come back, but with the failure of the second engine, the pilot crash lands the plane after ordering everyone to bail out on Seven Mile Pond, which is now Banting Lake. As you can see, it wasn't a Hollywood crash, no fire, no explosion. Banting survived the crash, but died about 12 hours later. Uh, almost immediately, rumors of sabotage began because of Banting's last diary entry. One cannot, however, eliminate sabotage from one's imagination. This would be a grand place for it. Official inquiry was held and a, a report produced, uh, but not released at the time. Uh, New York papers and Canadian papers tried to push the sabotage theory and the government said that wasn't the case. Years later, when you go to the files, uh, the report has gone missing from two different archives. So it has a bit of a smell to it. People would say, why would anybody want to, to kill Banting, you know, savior of millions with insulin? It's because we know so very little about this military research at that time. He's considered one of the four mandarins of the Second World War. And the best way I can describe his work, are two private letters from C.J. McKenzie to General McNaughton. Today, the papers pay magnificent tribute to Dr. Banting. What the public doesn't realize is the work he was doing for the council may have outweighed the insulin period. Quite a statement to make considering over a million people are on insulin by 1940. So how about we put a little perspective, you know, you've just buried a good friend. So two years later in another private letter, so we're not here to pump Banting's tires, Mac uh, Mackenzie writes, General, the stark tragedy of Sir Frederick's death still weighs heavily upon me. Today, yet another one of his projects has come through to fruition and will get us a decided advantage over our enemies. Major Banting truly knew what was important in this war.